thank you again, David. Well, brethren, we've now come to have a look at the uh, judgments on Semiramis, the mother of Harlots, the, the system which is built around her. The symbology goes right back, as we've found in our studies, to Semiramis. So we're going to have a look very briefly at Revelation 17 and 18. It has to be brief, of course, because uh, there's a huge amount of material in here. We're going to try and just pick the eyes out of it. <coughs> so here we have our harlot system of Rome. And this is the system that makes war with the Lamb in Revelation 17 and verse 14. It says, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is the Lord of hosts and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. So we begin with that verse and we're going to end with that verse, God willing, a little later on. Because that actually expresses our Abrahamic hope. And we know, of course, that God's call of Abraham is intimately connected with his unwinding of the system of Nimrod and of Semiramis. And we'll see how that comes out a little later on. Now this chart that I'm putting up in front of you now, some of you may have seen this before. It is a chart which tries to set out the way in which the visions of glory of the apocalypse are placed in between the chapters that deal with prophecy. It begins, of course, with the multitudinous Christ vision of chapter 1, verses 13 to 16. Now, I'll let you just settle on that for a while because it takes a while to understand what's happening here. But over here you can see the red vertical line of the resurrection of the judgment seat. This is where it all begins for us. Then you have other uh, um, vertical lines. You have this vertical line here, which is the Armageddon line. That's why, of course, you've got the return of Christ, and this is the ten-year period that will take. One, to raise the dead, judge them, that there'll be a, a, a marriage, a period of, of uh, uh, at least one year of rejoicing with Christ, and then a period of another three, four or five years of preparation, and then three and a half years prior to Armageddon, Elijah goes out with the company of saints. So there's a whole heap of things that have to happen in that 10 years. And in fact, you can I would normally spend eight or nine sessions just dealing with the content of that of that 10-year period. So there's a lot in there. Then we have this other vertical line here, which of course is the end of the 40 years of judgment that will follow Armageddon. And then we have another red line, which is the end of the thousand year reign of Christ. And then beyond that, of course, we have the time when God is all and in all. So you got the idea of the, the structure of the timings here? Well, what these black boxes do is to show the area of this period that that particular vision of glory covers. Now, we're going to have a look at Revelation uh, chapter 17. Uh, and we're going to see uh, where this fits in the scheme of things. It's all about this period, of course, from Armageddon to here. Now, I put that up because it's, it's very important, I believe, to know where the visions of the apocalypse occur in the scheme of things. Uh, chapter 14 uh, is here, of course, and that is a, a wonderful chapter. That all happens in that period, too. Uh, this is the, the period of the judgment of the harlot system. So let's go back and just review very briefly with this slide what we have done and what we intend to do in this study. This is the pattern of Roman Catholic resistance to Christ for 40 years after Armageddon. Revelation 17 verses 1 to 3 read, Come hither, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters. We've read that a couple of times. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. Now we know what this is. It's the wilderness of the peoples. Because the, the, the woman sits upon a scarlet-coloured beast in a, on the sea, in the sea, but that sea is called a wilderness. And we are told in verse 15 of this chapter that that sea represents peoples, nations and tongues. So it's a wilderness of peoples. And that's the description that is given to Europe in Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel 20, when it talks about Elijah's work, is to bring Israel into the wilderness of the peoples. In other words, the body of Europe. That's where they will be judged. That's where both the Catholic system will be judged and the rebels of those returning under Elijah will be removed. They will be purged out. 
from among them. It will be a long process in the second exodus of Israel under Elijah. And if you want to fill out this information, then you need to take a note of Eureka Volume 5, and we're talking here about the Logos edition, the brown cover books. Eureka Volume 5, pages 38 to 39, 74 to 75, 278 to 279, spells all of this stuff out, especially in relation to the time periods. It's all there uh, in Eureka. So let's have a look then at what happens here. At Armageddon, you've got the beginning of the seventh vial, which we considered in the previous session. That is also called in Matthew 24, verse 30, the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. This is what, of course, destroys the infrastructure of the world, makes it impossible uh, for the Jews to remain where they are, having received the message that they are going to be removed, now they will want to move. And so off, they go, off Elijah goes with the saints to gather them from all portions of the earth. Now, Armageddon constitutes a very heavy blow to the papacy, doesn't it? Because it's in cahoots with Gog, it's part of that confederacy, even though, of course, they don't send too many soldiers, it's a heavy blow to the papacy. That's not going to stop them. Psalm 2 tells us that the, that the Pope collects his people together. This is after Christ is installed on the throne of David at the foot of Mount Zion that's been exalted by the events of Armageddon. The papacy takes the next ten years to form up his rebellion against Christ. So ten years later, Rome's destroyed. Now, I know some brethren... Hang on, how do you, how do you know that? I want you to come back to Revelation 14. Revelation 14. Revelation 14 begins with the Lamb upon Mount Zion. So this is post-Armageddon. The next thing in verses 6 and 7 is a proclamation to the nation. We'll consider that in a moment. That goes on for 10 years. And verse 8 says, And there followed, notice this, there followed another angel. Now in fact, in the Greek, there's another word there that hasn't been translated in the King James. It's the word Deuteros. There followed another second angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all the nations drink of the wine, etc. It's telling us something. Rome, as a city, as the centre of the harlot system, is destroyed after the proclamation is made. It comes after the proclamation. There followed another second angel. So ten years after Armageddon, Rome, which obviously they're trying to rebuild anyway, Rome as a city is completely destroyed. They can't stay there. It's not there anymore. So the papacy has to go somewhere else. So it's another heavy blow, isn't it? Huge blow. So they take another dive, does the papal system. Stop them? No. They rebuild themselves in Central Europe, in Mago. Now this is the exact pattern, isn't it? This is the time of the restitution of the beast of the sea when the Pope's got power. That power is now removed from him in Rome, but the beast of the earth emerges. The beast of the earth was based in Germany, in Magog. It's going to happen all over again. The Holy Roman Empire will come back into existence when that happens. But of course this is the time when Elijah will have Israel in the wilderness of the peoples. And that's where there's a clash goes on now for 30 years this hour of judgment and it culminates here with the destruction of the false prophet and this empire that supports him but then there's this period of clean up which we talked about in the previous session at least four years could be more Christ comes next year it'll be five years it comes a year after it'll be six years and so on but I think you can get a bit of a feel it can't be all that it won't take any more than a decade or so to clean up the remnant, I don't think. But we'll see. Got a picture? All right. Well, that's what we're going to talk about. Talk about the destruction of this system. So while we're in Revelation 14, let's have a look at this Midheaven proclamation because it actually talks about that period of 30 years, intense period of 30 years. In verse 6, we see, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven. Now, I'll stop there. Why the midst of heaven? Well, because, you see, heaven is the symbol for government. 
earth is a symbol for people. We've got a ceiling in this hall here. Let's say that's the heaven. We have a floor. That's the earth. So if you're flying in mid-heaven, you're flying between the ceiling and the floor. True? It's a mid-heaven proclamation. Well, what's that about? It's very important, actually, because, you see, this is about the saints going out post-Armageddon to give a message. And the message, we're told what that is in verse 7. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him. Now, this is, come, comes from Psalm 2, by the way. All right. So, the saints have a message. It, they're going to call upon the peoples of the world to submit to the rule of Christ. And the Pope's going to say, No, 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 he's Antichrist. And listen to him. Now, what if the saints went out and spoke to the kings, the rulers, the governors of the nations? What do you reckon the governors of the nations would do? Tell their people? Of course not. How much does your government tell you? Of course they do, Chris. Yeah. They tell you what they want you to hear. Alright? But you see, Christ's not going to allow that to happen. The message is going to go to to the governors because it's mid-heaven. They will hear it. But so will the common people. Everyone's going to hear it. So nobody can say, well, no one told me. I don't have any choice. They're all going to have a choice. Every one of them. Big and small. That's why it's a mid-heaven proclamation. It says here, they have that everlasting gospel. Now that sounds like they're going to do some seminars and preach the gospel. Not so. Alright? Not so. The word in the Greek, or two words in the Greek, evangelion, aeonian, good news pertaining to the age. Well, it's good news to those who listen to it, but it's very bad news for those who don't. Because this is actually a warning, that if you don't submit, then you're dead. So that's good news only if you accept it. So it's not about preaching the gospel. That'll come later. This is about giving a warning. They, it says they preach. Well, a word actually is rendered in the RV, proclaim. This is not about preaching. This is about proclaiming. It's a proclamation. That's why we call it a mid-heaven proclamation. And the message, as I said, comes from Psalm 2, primarily. But in that message is this phrase. Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. Worship him that made heaven and earth, etc., So what's the hour of judgment? Well, one hour in the apocalypse is a period of 30 years. And this is what Brother Thomas says in Eureka Volume 2. He says this, being then the 12th of the cycle, it is also the hour of that cycle, the small cycle of light called a day, which is the root of all the greater cycles, was divided by the Jews into 12 equal parts, and the night into other 12. So the Jews had a 12-hour day, a 12-hour night. This is the, in fact, I want you to just turn to Revelation chapter 9. It's a couple of few pages back. Revelation 9. In verse 15. Now this is about the, the, the sixth trumpet, the second woe, the rise of the Turkish Empire in AD 1062. And it, a time is specified for the unfolding judgments of the sixth trumpet. It says in verse 15 of Revelation 9, And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour, and a day, and a month, and a year. Now I'm going to stop there, because I'm not really concerned about what that means. I'm concerned about what Brother Thomas is saying here. Because he says, Revelation 9.15, which we've just read, where an hour is referred to, this is the only place in the Apocalypse where an hour stands for 30 days. It occurs in seven other places after this. But in all these, it stands alone. So Revelation 9.15 is the only place where an hour stands for 30 days. The other seven occurrences, and you'll see them in a moment, are all 30 years. They all represent 30 years. The judicial period of 30 years, or the 12th of a time. So how do we arrive at this 30 years? Well, there are two ways of doing it, both of which complement each other. Now these are the occurrences, the seven occurrences, where the one hour of the apocalypse occurs. 14 verse 7 is the first, 17, 12, 18, 10, 17 and 19. 
couple of those I think was used twice. But anyway, seven occur. Now we know and understand the use of the of the one day equals one year principle, the day for a year principle. Look, I don't need to take you chaps back to Genesis 47, 9, Numbers 14, 34, Ezekiel 4, Hosea 6, Luke 1, uh, Luke 13, I should say. I don't need to take you back there because all of those passages plainly demonstrate the day for a year principle. Just take one of them in passing. When the spies came back, having spent 40 days walking through the land, what did God say when they brought back an evil report? He said to Israel, you're going to walk in the wilderness a year for every day that the spies walk through the land. They were there for 40 days, you're going to spend 40 years. It's a day for a year principle. And all the other, other passages there prove that. One hour is the twelfth part of a Jewish day. The twelfth part of a year, if we're using the day for a year principle, is one month. And a Jewish month had 30 days in it. Now, if we're going to use the day for a year principle, let's use it here too. So 30 days here represents 30 years. People say, hang on, that's like a, an elastic band. You know, you've got the elastic band, you go... <laughs> no. It's not. <laughs> not an elastic band at all. One hour in the apocalypse does represent 30 years. But if that's the only proof that you had, you might say, oh, maybe. But no, you don't, that's not the only proof. I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. Revelation 8, verse 1 is the opening of the seventh seal. Now, most of you will be aware that the seventh seal was opened in 324 AD when Constantine defeated Licinius and then took his capital from Rome to Constantinople. It says this in verse 1. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Now we spoke about this the other day, so it shouldn't be new to, to any of you. Silence in heaven. What's that? No noise in government. All right? No warfare. Peace. Peace. Peace in government. That's what that symbol means. Now, that peace descended upon the Roman Empire for the first time in many, many decades in 324 AD, when Constantine became the sole ruler of the empire. But he died in 337, 14 years later. Now, it says that silence was in heaven, or peace in government, about the space. Not, it doesn't say half an hour. It says about the space of half an hour. Well, 14 is pretty close to 15. It's just about 15, isn't it? It's about the space of half an hour. So if 15 is half an hour, then 30 is an hour. Got it? And when he died, guess what happened? There was no longer silence in heaven. There was big trouble. So that is a historical proof. But it's not the only one. Come to chapter 11 of the Apocalypse. To the second great earthquake, because chapter 11 is about the French Revolution. It's about the death of the witnesses in 1685. Their subsequent resurrection in 1789. 105 years later, or three and a half days later. So here we have... In verse 13 of Revelation 11, reference made to the second great earthquake of the Apocalypse. This is the French Revolution. And the same hour was there a great earthquake. So the French Revolution began in 1789. When did it end? Well, read the historians. 1819. How many years between 1789? And 1819, 30. In the same hour, that's when it was, 30 year period, French Revolution. 
And of course we know that the sixth vial began in 1820 with the beginning of the process of the drying up of Euphrates. So that is another proof that it ended in 1819. So there's two historical proofs that an hour in the apocalypse represents 30 years. You can have the mathematical one, if you're a mathematically inclined person, you don't like that, well then have a look at the historical one. So then, here we are. We have Nebuchadnezzar's image, the kingdom of men initially founded by Nimrod. It talks about the unfolding of history, but that's not its real reason. Its real reason is because it stands complete in the land of Israel in the latter days, but a very important part of that image is this power here. The woman sitting astride the scarlet-coloured beast, the harlot system. And it's that system which is going to be the subject of divine judgments. We want to just now focus a little bit more on that. Because this is the work of the seventh vile angel. So come back to Revelation chapter 17 and verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels. So this is one of the angels of the vials and it has to be, I believe, the seventh angel because this is about judgment upon the harlot system which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither. Now this is the word dura. It actually means come along. So John is being invited to be personally involved in the work of this judgment. The previous six vials have been poured out through the work of the angels using men like Napoleon. But now the time has come for John, who will be the subject of resurrection, like many others, to become personally involved in this work of the judgment of the harlot system. Come along. That's the invitation. Come along. Now this harlot sits upon many waters, and we're told in verse 15, as we've said a number of times, what that is. Peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And she said to reign over the kings of the earth. Now the Roman Empire was looked like that. In its fullest extent, it looked like that. So you see, this is a way of interpreting who this harlot is. Now we've had people suggest that the harlot of the apocalypse is Israel. An apostate Israel. What utter rubbish that is. Did Israel ever reign at any time of its history over all the kings of the then known earth? What utter rubbish. There's only one power. And bear in mind... It had to be at the time when John wrote. It had to be at AD 96. Because the language that is used is about the present time. Read it. It says, this, have a look at verse um, 18. The woman which thou sawest is that great city, so it's in existence, which reigneth. And that is in the singular, feminine by the way, and it should be rendered literally, because it's also in the present tense, an active voice, it should be rendered, which has kingship. In other words, right then, when John wrote it, if there's only one power that that could possibly be, it's Rome. So here's this woman sitting upon the scarlet-coloured beast that the saints are going to have to deal with, because it will come back into power. Now, it's said to have committed fornication with the kings of the earth and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication and of course we know full well how influential the papacy has been uh, in, uh, in even recent decades men will defer to it even, even the thug Putin has been there giving gifts to the Pope the mind which hath wisdom so it's easy to identify this woman, isn't it? The mind which hath wisdom. Identifying the woman and the seven heads of the beast, of verse 3. Verse 9 we're told, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Rome was built on seven hills. In verse 10 we're told, and there are seven kings. Rome had seven forms of government, as we've seen. 
In verse 18, we've just referred to that verse. It was the city that then reigned over the kings of the earth. It's in the present tense, which has kingship when John wrote. The seven hills of Rome were on coins of Rome. Here we've got the coin of Emperor Vespasian. All right? On the other side of that coin, you've got a woman. By the way, she looks like she's got soldiers' garments on, weapons on. Roma, so here's Rome. She's sitting on seven hills. He goes back and there's the wolf, you know, they're feeding the founders of Rome, allegedly. So here are the seven hills of Rome. There are Rome's seven forms of government. And we saw, of course, that the imperial, though wounded, was restored in our previous study. So the evidence is quite plain. You can't mistake that. So this power being referred to here, which is going to make war with the land, has to be a reference to the latter-day form of this system. The latter-day manifestation of the beast of the sea. A revival of papal political power following the devastation of the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars, which are referred to in verse 16. Now this is why the sixth vial has to be longer than the others. Remember how I mentioned that? So let's just look at this aspect of the subject. Verse 16. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore. I ask you the question, when did they hate the whore? In the events of the French Revolution and the vials that were poured out thereafter. That's when they hated the whore. What did they do to her? Verse 16. And shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh. I mean, they, they took over Catholic territory. They, they uh, took hold of Catholic buildings. They burned Catholic churches. So they ate her flesh, so to speak. They consumed what she owned all through Europe, particularly in France, but all through Europe. So these European nations, the Ten Horns, hated the whore in the period of the French Revolution and beyond. Now, if you hate the whore and you consume her flesh, it is going to take a little while, isn't it, to get to the point that's referred to back in verses 10 to 12. Sorry, verses 10 to 13. So let's go back to verse 10. And there are seven kings, so that is seven forms of government. Five have fallen when John was writing. One is, that's the imperial, and the other is not. It's not yet come. That's the, you know, the, the thing's going to be revived. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. So the Gothic lasts for a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth. Now the eighth is the revival of the sixth. Okay. Now if you read Brother Thomas in Eureka, he says this eighth head is actually, in its final version, it's the revived Holy Roman Empire. That's where it ends up, the revived Holy Roman Empire. And he goeth into perdition, it says. Verse 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. How long's that? Thirty years. When? That's the 30 years from the destruction of Rome, 10 years after Armageddon. That's when they received their power with the beast. That's when the papacy, having Rome destroyed, and the Pope that was in the Vatican, if the Vatican's still standing, the Pope that was in Rome, when Rome's destroyed, he goes down to Gurgler. That's when the Catholic system resorts to Central Europe and elects another one. That's when you get the revival of the beast of the earth. That's when you have an emperor and a pope back again, a two-horned beast back again. That's the eighth head, that Brother Thomas suggests. And he's right, it's the eighth head, it's the revived beast of the earth. That's the 30-year period 
when these ten kings will have power with the beast for one hour. I'm not sure that's 100% clear in people's minds. Maybe I should go back a slide or two. No, I can't do that because I'll muck rather harder. But we'll go back to that a little later on. Have a look at the slide again. So it's that period. Let's just briefly review it. You have Armageddon. You have 10 years proclamation. Then the destruction of Rome. And the next 30 years leading up to Christ's total rule of the earth. That's the 30 years. That's the one hour. Right? That's when they receive power with the beast for one hour. And that's why it says in verse 14, sorry, let's just read verse 13. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Can I ask you the question? Do the European nations give their power and strength to the papacy today? No. But in that time, they will. They'll be under the total domination of the Pope. They give their power and strength. They have one mind to do that. And what do they do? Verse 14. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Okay? That's what this is about. This is about the destruction of the latter day form of Samaramis, the mother of harlots, so called mother of God in the Catholic system. So how can we identify this system? Well, look at verse 4 of Revelation 17. Verse 4 says, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet colour and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Now, this is Pope Benedict XVI. And he was one who was very particular about doing things the right way. He's German, by the way, so he's very, very particular about doing it the right way. Gold braiding, scarlet vest, right? I'm sure purple's there somewhere. So here is 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 the man who presented himself in those colours, braided with gold. All sorts of precious stones. What about this title, Mother of Harlots, in verse 5? And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the Mother of Harlots and Abominations of the Earth. Now ancient harlots used to display their name on their forehead. Modern harlots put their information in newspapers and online. But ancient harlots would write their name on their forehead. And, moreover... One of the words written was mystery. Now mystery was once engraved on the papal tiara. They took it off, of course, eventually. Rome proclaims herself as mother and mistress of all the churches. Now, when I was in, uh, in Rome, in, Vatican, in the Vatican Square, this is not actually my photograph, but I've got one of this from a distance, because you know, it's up on the wall where the papal apartments are. But here's Mary with... Jesus, allegedly. And down underneath it is the sign, Mata Ecclesia, Mother Church. Mata Ecclesia. Claims herself mistress, mother and mistress of all the churches. And of course, she's drunk with the blood of saints. It says in verse 6, And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs or witnesses of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great, not admiration, of course, the word is rendered uh, elsewhere, uh, astonishment. You've got the idea of, um, of, of being astonished at what he saw. I, I was astonished, says another translation. And I'll just pick that up. It's actually Rotherham. I was astonished with great astonishment because of what this system had done, presenting itself as the, as the mother church. Unbelievable. Now, Catholic persecution came right down to World War II. And whatever the Catholics say, they were involved in the Holocaust to some degree. Some Catholics stood aside, some opposed it, but they were involved, particularly in areas like Yugoslavia. 
Now the ten horns are ten European kings formed originally by the barbarian invasion to the Roman Empire in the 4th and 5th centuries. And of course, that's perfectly consistent with what we read in Daniel 7. In Daniel 2, ten toes on the image. Okay, Revelation 13, verse 1. Perfectly consistent. For these are the ten kings who will have power with the beast for one hour until they're destroyed. Did you say those were all southern teams? Did you say those were all southern teams? They're going to be in southern Europe, yeah. The old, see, the fourth beast of Daniel 7 has to be revived. It has to be there to be destroyed. So Daniel 7 verse 7 has a history, but it's also got a future. Because in verse 11 of Daniel 7, it says that Christ destroys the fourth beast and burns his body. In other words, completely eliminates him. Whereas the other three beasts go on for, it says, a season at a time, or the millennial period. Now, the fact that it's burned means that it's utter destruction. The reason for the utter destruction is they won't submit. What do you do if they won't submit? Well, you destroy them. What I want to do now is to use this slide just to review what we've been talking about. The ten horns hate the whore, but later, under God, submit to Rome's rule. And this is why, as we said, the sixth vial had to be much, much longer than the other vials. We go right back to 1789 to the French Revolution. The work of Napoleon, the unleashing of the revolutionary spirit in Europe culminated in the loss of papal temporal power in 1870. Remember that? So here's 1870. French Revolution worked itself out. Its ultimate result was the loss of temporal power. Now there were two world wars in the 20th century, 1914 to 18 and 1939 to 45. But between those two world wars, something very significant happened. In 1929, Mussolini... Il Duque, Duque, the leader of Italy, the fascist who joined with Hitler, restored the papal temporal power. He gave a hundred acres in Rome to the Pope. Became Vatican City. Now you saw last night. It's a separate state. The Italian government, the Italian police can't go in there It's a separate country within a country. So what's that? Temporal power. Rulership over land and people. So 1929 saw the restitution of the temporal power that was lost in 1870. So you see, we're beginning to get a restoration of the the ten horns who hated the whore back here in the French Revolution period, we're beginning to see the restoration of their relationship with the whore. And ultimately, of course, God will put it in their hearts to fulfil his will and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast. And that ultimately will be seen in that 30-year period when they will have power. Now, this progress went on. In 1957, the Catholic Church underwrote the common market now known as the European Union, saw the re-emergence of Catholic political influence in Europe. And that process has been ongoing ever since. Pope John Paul II, of course, did a lot of work in that regard. And we're not that far. We're inching towards the end, aren't we? Won't be too far down the track, but that end will come. And we can see that happening. Here's 57. The Treaty of Rome was signed on the 25th of March 1957 in the Camp of Doglio, established the EEC, now known as the EU. The original six countries were France, Belgium, Luxembourg, Netherlands, Italy and West Germany. And here they are in the Camp of Doglio. Well, here they're back again. But this time it's 2004. And they're sitting under the, the hand of Pope Clement XI. Here he is, Pope sitting behind there. Well, they're signing another document to enhance European Union. And of course, they were there in October 2004, 
when 25 EU nations gathered in Rome under the watchful gaze of Mary, there she's up there, and Julius Caesar, here he is here, signing more documents about European unity. So you see, these who had hated the whore are now coming back to support the whore. That's why she can say, I sit a queen and am no widow. That's why when Gog's destroyed in the land, they resort to Central Europe and say, I'm not a widow. I might have lost my husband, so to speak, Gog, in the Battle of Armageddon, but I'm not a widow. I'll go to Magog. All right? What a system that is, eh? So here's our chart. This is the ten horns that receive power for 30 years. That's their period that they're of one mind completely with the papacy, give their power to the beast, but of course they're going to be removed. So as we said, we start with the revived beast of the sea, we end up with the revived beast of the earth, and then we've got the destruction of that beast and the Pope. We believe in 2060. And that will be worked out by the work of Elijah. As he brings the Jews into the body of Europe, into the wilderness of the peoples. It's the only wilderness of the peoples in the Bible. And they have to fight their way back to the land. Over 30 years of very violent conflict until they come back to the borders of the land. They are baptised and brought into the bonds of the covenant. That is how the judgment will be poured out. So finally, brethren, before we sit down and have something to eat, I want you to have a look with me again at verse 14 of Revelation 17. We won't read the early part of that verse again. We've read it twice already in this session. We're going to read the end of the verse. For he is the Lord of lords and King of kings. Now the lords, plural, and kings, plural here, are the saints. And of them it then says... And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Called? Yes. Like Abraham. I called him alone, said God. But he aren't going to be alone for too long. Because many others will be called in him. Many will be blessed in Abraham. In him all the families of the earth will finally be blessed. God began a process to unwind Nimrod's apostasy and to end the kingdom of men by calling Abraham from Ur of the Chaldees. They're called. They're chosen. Nehemiah 9 verse 7 tells us that Abraham was chosen by God. Could I suggest, brethren that you and I and all of our brothers and sisters throughout the earth and all who have gone before us have been chosen by God, in a sense. In Romans 4.13, Paul tells us that Abraham is heir of the world by faith. These are called. They're chosen. But they've got something that's absolutely essential. They remain faithful to the end. Without that, they're not going to be there. They remain faithful to the end. So you see, Revelation 17 verse 14 is about our Abrahamic hope. And we're living it out now. We've got to make sure we're ready because we've got a job to do, brethren, amongst the multitude of the saints. It is to deal a death blow to Semiramis. And to get rid of all of the nonsense of her husband, Nimrod, out of the earth. Because Yahweh will destroy Nimrod. And that's the work of the seventh vile angel. We'll see a bit more about that tonight, God willing. The next session after dinner is going to be how to contend earnestly for the faith once delivered to the saints.